In just a minute, I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians, starting at chapter 11, verse 16. Um, but I do want to mention a few things before we read that passage, just to put some context on this here. 2 Corinthians is kind of a, a complex letter. And it's complex because Paul had known these people for quite some time. And there was a lot going on leading up to this letter. Now Paul's relationship to the church in Corinth is, it's complicated, really. If you're, uh, if you're familiar with Facebook and there's a relationship status there, one of your options is, it's complicated. This would be Paul's relationship with the Corinthian church. There was a lot of ups and downs in their relationship, lots of rocky times. Um, just some things for you to, to note that's, that are not on your outline here. Paul started the church in Corinth about six years beforehand. His first visit, he stayed a year and a half, so he knew them reasonably well. He continued on his second missionary journey. He stayed in Ephesus then, and from Ephesus he corresponded with them. One of those letters was 1 Corinthians. And their response to 1 Corinthians was not that great. They did not take his admonitions very well. And so Paul uh, kind of changed his plans and he made an emergency and he calls it a painful visit to them because of their response to this letter. He didn't stay very long there because it was such an awful visit. So he withdrew and he wrote a severe letter to them, as he says in one point in 2 Corinthians. And then after that severe letter, he has Titus go to see how they are doing. And Titus came back with some good news. Titus reported that many were grieved and they had repented after this severe letter that Paul wrote. But there was some bad news too. There were false apostles that had infiltrated the church and destroyed Paul's reputation. They basically came in and said a bunch of bad things about Paul and who he was and discredited his whole ministry there. So some of the things we, from what we can tell from 2 Corinthians here is they said that they had seen visions of heaven, whereas Paul hadn't. They argued that they are eloquent speakers, whereas Paul is not, and Paul admits that. They had healings where Paul couldn't heal himself from a certain problem. And they were super apostles, whereas Paul was a weak fool. Something along those lines is what they would have said. So, with that in mind, let's take a look at the passage here. 2 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 16. I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool, so that I too may boast a little. What I am saying with this boastful confidence, I say not as the Lord would, but as a fool. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourselves. For you bear it if somebody makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, in danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, 
in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am I not weak? Who is made to fall, and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that he cannot tell, to which man may not utter. On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from being com- becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So we all have, we all have our boasts. We have things that, about us that we take some pride in that makes us feel good when others put us down. When I was growing up, my boast was uh, martial arts. When I was young and other kids might pick on me or put me down or something like that, I kind of always had this thought, well, I could beat them up. You know, that kind of thing. But, to be honest, there was, there was a lot of weaknesses there. Taekwondo being my boast is, uh, is really great when you're standing up, but if you're on the ground, Taekwondo does not help you that much. Taekwondo is all punches and kicks. And so if you're on the ground, you're not going to be very good. Uh, also, I was, a, I was a purple belt for two years and didn't test for two years because I was really the class clown. There was uh, one time I was trying to impress my sister about how close I could get to a wall when I punched. So I had her stand right next to this door jam and say, stand right here, watch how close I can get. And wham, I really hurt my hand. <laughs> she still brings that up to this day. There was one time I was trying to impress some kids and I kicked this sign and I ended up falling and looking like an idiot. There was, uh, when I tested for my second degree black belt, I was uh, so out of breath that I couldn't even finish the test. I was heaving and, and we had to do all these jump back kicks and everything like that. And after you do a few of those, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't keep up with breathing. And I had to ask to sit out. I had to finish that test later. So we have our boasts. But do we boast in those or do we recognize our weaknesses? Verse 16, I repeat, let no one think me foolish, but even if you do, accept me as a fool so that I too may boast a little. Paul is basically saying boasting is what fools do. People who are foolish are the ones who are boasting in themselves, their abilities, and so forth. He's basically saying, I don't want to be a fool, but if you think I am, then I might as well boast a little bit so that I can, 
I can uh, take advantage of this. Now, in biblical times, pretty much all the ancient world, for that matter, humility was not a virtue. You were not considered good and solid person if you were humble. Aristotle thought that pride was virtuous, vanity was excess, and humility was deficient. Caesar Augustus, the uh, great Caesar here, there's a picture. He was very boastful. He says, when I was 19 years old, by my own deliberation and at my own expense, I raised an army by which I brought the republic, oppressed by the domination of a faction, into a condition of freedom. For that reason, the Senate, by honorary decrees, enrolled me into its order in the consulship of Gaius, assigning me a consular position. Twice I received triumphal ovations. Three times I received full curule triumphs. Twenty times in one did I receive the appellation of imperator. Because of these things of which, or legates of mine, acting under my auspices, accomplished successfully on land and sea, 55 times the Senate decreed thanksgiving should be made to the immortal gods on my behalf. And he goes on and on and on. That's just a couple highlights of what he says. Boasting is human to do. If you're at a job interview, it doesn't really serve you well to be humble at that point. If you're running for office, it doesn't serve you to be humble very much. If you look at the political candidates and their advertisements, there's a lot of boasting going on, or putting down the opponent, at least, So I have a couple examples here, and in case the IRS is watching, I'm going to give equal time to both of our governor candidates here. So Gretchen Whitmer, in one of her ads here, she says, like a lot of people in Michigan, I was brought up to work hard. My first job was at Burlingame Lumber. I stocked the shelves at Target, and I worked the line at the Royal Fork Buffet. I was also the first woman elected as a leader in Michigan Senate, where I took on the tough fight like expanding Medicaid and increasing the minimum wage, blowing up health care while your costs go up and up, it, because it's about time we fix those darn roads. It's time to get it done, she says. And then Bill Schutte, there was an article that he wrote, this was in the Holland Sentinel. I recently received high praise from the nation's preeminent grassroots leader for tax cuts, Grover Norquist, the president of Americans for Tax Reform, said, Bill Schutte has been a consistent tax fighter and friend of taxpayers. Nobody will fight harder or more effectively to cut taxes in Michigan, as President Trump has done nationally. I am grateful for Mr. Norquist's acknowledgement of my commitment to Michigan taxpayers. He goes, he goes on there, too. The boasting... We have our boasts. Paul is basically saying here, by the foolish standards of the world, these false apostles are better. Fine. In verses 20 and 21, it says, For you bear it if somebody makes slaves of you or devours you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. If if they want to be better in that, those ways, that's fine. He basically acknowledges. And so Paul, he goes on his own boasts. He says, all right, I'm going to speak like a fool here. So please bear with me. I'm going to go on and I'm going to do some boasting. And he does. But his boasting is a little awkward. So just like at the beginning when I was talking about my martial arts boast, but I told you all of the, the weaknesses uh, that I had in it. This is how Paul goes about it. Paul boasts except that his boasting is self-deprecating. And he seems to have known 
Caesar's boasts because he kind of follows a similar pattern. You can see that there. Caesar says, twice I received triumphal ovations, three times I received full curule triumphs, 20 times in one did I receive the appellation of imperator. And Paul, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. You notice how Paul goes from five to three to one. And Caesar goes from twice to three to twenty. The direction even shows where they're trying to go. Forty lashes was a Jewish punishment of pain and shame. This was not something to boast about. If you received those 40 lashes minus one, that was a shameful punishment. It was embarrassing. One of the ancient historians, Josephus, said that it was a most disgraceful penalty for a free man. It was meant to use pain and shame to correct your behavior because you were so poorly or badly in the wrong. Beaten with rods, he says. That was a Roman punish, punishment of pain and shame. So he's humiliated and shamed by the Jews, his own people, as well as the Romans. It was an embarrassment to receive this. In fact, no Roman citizen should ever have received it. Paul was a Roman citizen. He could have flung his citizenship card and gotten out of that. And maybe he even tried to, but maybe there was a lynch mob going on and he didn't have the chance. So these are humiliating punishments and Paul is bringing them up in his boasts. He says he was stoned. Stoning is a Jewish punishment that is only for the worst crimes. So basically, when he says, I was stoned, he's basically saying, I was sentenced to death like an adulterer or blasphemer. This is not something you would boast about. This is not something that you would want to even have anybody know about. This would be a shameful thing. And then, kind of those... Verses 32 and 33 there, if you notice that, he suddenly talks about being lowered in a basket. He's basically saying, I was lowered down the wall like a cowardly soldier. There's some context for that too. He was probably being lowered in even a fish basket that smelled of dead fish and scales and such. And he was sneaking away in the night. That would be like a cowardly retreat. In the Roman army... One of the highest honors you could achieve is to receive the wall crown. The wall crown. And that means that you were the first one, when you were attacking a city, to actually scale the wall. You were the first one to make it to the top. So, that's the highest Roman military honor. And Paul, instead of going up a wall, he's going down a wall. Instead of having a victory over a city, he is running away in defeat. So there's some pictures here that are self-deprecating. And then, towards in chapter 12 there, he gets on to his worst, or maybe his greatest shame. He talks about a thorn in his flesh. He says... I have has given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. Okay. Paul, servant of Christ, man of God, preaching the good news, casting out demons, and so forth, has Satan's angel harassing him constantly. That's... That's pretty embarrassing. He says, I have an angel of Satan tormenting. Messenger and angel are the same word in Greek. So Paul, here's somebody who has cast out many demons and he can't even cast away his own. And he talks about how I, I tried to pray about this. I prayed three times 
I pleaded with God three times. My prayers for help were met with no. God didn't answer that. He didn't answer those prayers like I wanted him to. It's humiliating for an apostle to have to say that God didn't deliver me from this. And it's easy to imagine people criticizing him saying, well, you must not have enough faith then. You know, people say that when prayers don't go answered like we would like them to. Some, there are some people who think that way, that if you have enough faith, then you will get whatever you want. Well, sometimes God has other plans. And sometimes God says no. Even when you're an apostle. And that's just the way it is. But Paul, is. this is kind of a shameful thing. Or kind of embarrassing. Three times in our passage today, Paul specifically mentions boasting of weakness. He comes back to that three times. In 11 verse 30, If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. 12 verse 5, On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast except for my weaknesses. Verse 9, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. This is very counterintuitive. Why would you boast about being weak? Why would you hold yourself up as a loser or a failure or somebody who just can't get it done? Paul says a little earlier, Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord, for it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Our honor comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from our boasts. And so Paul knows this, so he's not going to boast in himself. He's going to let the Lord honor him. Jesus shows that God's honor comes through weakness. When Peter or Peter said, you know, you are the, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then right after that, Jesus said, well, i, I got to tell you something. Here's the plan. The Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be handed over. And he's going to be killed. And then he's, on the third day, he's going to be raised to life. A humiliating thing. Peter's like, no, that's not going to happen to you. That is too shameful to happen to you. Peter couldn't accept that. And that's why Jesus responds by saying, you don't have in mind the things of God. You have in mind the things of men. People's ideas of what honor is, of what success is. You got it backwards. By grace, we belong to Christ and we share in His heavenly honor. His triumphs are ours. His victory over sin is ours. His righteousness is ours. We have all of the rights and privileges of the Son of God. We have that status before the Father. That is the greatest honor that we could possibly have. That's where our honor comes from. What Jesus has done. Who He is. Because... By belonging to Him, as we said earlier, we have that same status. And to be like Christ in weakness is to have Christ's honor. The way He conducted His life was in weakness. And when we walk in that same path, we have His honor. We don't have our own manufactured honor. So, Christians, as Christians, we walk in weakness. And we can even boast about those weaknesses. Jesus was shamed by the world. The whole world rejected him and disowned him. 
and didn't just kill him, but had to shame him as well. But now he sits at God's right hand. He has the highest honor that God bestowed. So, walking in the way of Christ, Paul is basically saying, is walking in weakness. These false apostles here, they're boasting about their strengths, how they're better, how they're cooler, what they've done, what they've seen. That's not like Christ. That's boasting in yourself, who you are, what you've done. To be like Christ means to embrace weakness. Think about the Son of God before He became one of us. How much power and glory He had. And how that had to be set aside so that He could be one of us. He embraced weakness. That's the way of Christ. That's our example. So verse 9. I love this verse. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God's grace is strong enough, strong enough to carry us through any pain or any shame. And there's always a growth in grace. There's more grace that we can put our trust in and rely on. And we like to rely on ourselves and our own strength. We'd rather not have to rely on God's grace if we don't have to. That's human nature. That's in all of us. But God's grace is strong enough to carry us through anything. Anything. So, my thorn in the flesh, in the spirit of boasting and weaknesses... My thorn in the flesh, I've mentioned it before, is depression. I have clinical depression. I have seen many, many counselors for many, many years. I've been on many medications. I don't even know how many. I can't count them all. And none of it, none of that has taken this away. I've prayed about this many times. And begged God to take it away from me many times. And the answer has been no. My grace is sufficient for you. So that's a little humiliating to be able to, or to have to say, you know, as your pastor, the one who's supposed to lead you in the triumphs of Christ, is constantly feeling horrible about myself and sad and miserable all the time or a lot at the time anyway. We're supposed to be people of joy. You know, we're supposed to have the victory of Christ. And I'm leading all of you. That's kind of, it's kind of humiliating. It's kind of embarrassing. And it almost kept me from going into ministry, actually. Because how could I lead a bunch of people in the joy and the triumphs of Christ? When I'm constantly defeated and sad. But I'm here to tell you that God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't. God's grace has carried me through many difficult moments, many difficult times, and even times when I thought I'm not going to survive this. God's grace is sufficient. His power is there. And by His grace, we can overcome anything that the devil might throw at us. Anything. That's my testimony. To wrap up here, if you're desperate for human honor, as is human nature to do, then your boast is going to be in your strengths. You're going to talk about your achievements, who you are, who your parents are, what education you have, what job you have, your titles, the things that you've done, what you've built, and so forth. You're going to boast in those things. You're going to hold those things up when you feel beat down or discouraged. 
You're going to hold those up to people who might put you down. The false apostles did that. They boasted in their credentials, their achievements, and their deep spirituality. But Paul boasts in his sufferings, his failings, and his spiritual torment. If by grace you have Christ's honor, then you will boast in your weaknesses. Then you know that your honor comes from who Jesus is and what he has done. It won't come from yourself. You don't need to be the best or the coolest. You don't need to brag about yourself. Is Christ, when Christ is honored, then God's power is seen. So, my question for you is what is your boast? What do you boast about? Let's look at the screen here. What does your conclusion to this Lord's Prayer mean? For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever means we have made all these requests of you because as our all-powerful king, you not only want to, but are able to give us all that is good and because your holy name and not we ourselves should receive all the praise forever. God be praised. Let's bow our heads. Lord, our God in heaven, it's a wonderful thing to have the honor of Jesus Christ and all of the privileges that go with that. So Lord, since we have that honor, help us to learn to walk in weakness, to be able to even embrace that weakness, and to Lord, remember that we are walking in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior when we do that. And Lord, when we are weak, remind us and show us that your grace is is indeed sufficient for whatever we might encounter. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.